Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for loving us, Father, and we thank you for Christ. And Lord, we just thank you for everything that you've done for us. Lord, as these are being baptized this morning, Lord, we just ask that you, uh, Lord, just lead their lives, Father, and help them to come know you better. And Father, as, uh, as we go through the lesson this morning, we just ask that you, Lord, just bring your word out. Lord, just be with Brother Mike and be with Waylon as he uh, leads your song service. Lord, just prepare our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, one of the great experiences we have here as a church is to see folks publicly uh, publicly profess their faith through baptism. And uh, today is going to be another one of those memorable experiences. I feel like I'm in a duck pond about, about December and uh, uh, right before daylight and the water's real cool. But it'll be real memorable for this young lady. Carly, you come on. We're going to baptize next Sunday morning, and by the way, for those of you who've made decisions that haven't been baptized yet, uh, plan to come, and next Sunday morning, you want to be baptized, meet us in the fellowship hall at 1030, and uh, there's several of you. We'll try to get letters to you and remind you this week, but uh, Carly couldn't be here next week, so we're going to baptize her today, and uh, Carly Gonzalez, she came uh, in recent weeks professed her faith in Jesus Christ, asked Him to be your Lord and Savior. Is that right, Carly? Yes, Amen. Amen. And today she comes, and I, I met with her as I do each time before we baptize, and I said, Carly, I said, I want you to understand, first of all, this baptism is not what saves you. It has no part of your salvation. It's a testimony. It's you declaring out there that you were one person, that person died and is buried and is raised. In fact, that's what's written on the back of your shirt from the Bible. How we're buried with Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life. Okay? And so this is your shirt to keep. To remember this day. And the cold water to remember this day. Amen. <laughs> so uh, we praise the Lord for your willingness and how you're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. And you come and confess Him publicly here today. Amen. So I baptize you as my sister in the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Christ. And raised to walk in a new life. God bless you. <laughs> well, like I say, we have some more next Sunday. Uh, it's kind of on Mother's Day. We're going to begin the service by baptizing folks. I think that's a great way uh, to begin. And right now, I only have ladies to baptize next week. So uh, some of you men need to get right this week, all right? So we can, we can fill up the other side over here. And uh, so good to see you this morning in the house of the Lord. Matt, come on. Good morning. I'm going to go over a few announcements real quick. Uh, before I forget it, Young at Heart will be meeting on May the 12th. In the bulletin it says May the 10th. But they're going to Catfish Inn, and Catfish Inn is not open on Tuesday, so they moved it to Thursday. So it's on May the 12th. If you're planning on going, that's young at heart. If you're planning on going, please let Miss Charlene know. And uh, thank you. Uh, the other announcement I want to mention is we have a ladies' trip going May the 21st, 20th and 21st, going to the Bible Museum at the seminary in New Orleans. They've got a few more stops on the way. They're going to eat, they're going to visit some other places. It'll be a lot of fun. If you'd like to go, talk to my wife, Alta, or Linda Gale Albright. So they're getting all of this together. The, uh, tomorrow night, you can read the others, they're still in the bulletin, but tomorrow night, we will be meeting up here for a visitation and prayer time. Brother Mike will tell you more about a special prayer need that we need to pray about and he'll tell more about that when he comes up. So, Brother White always over here. Brother White. 
Dave Elif. I'm the Seattle Sin City missionary and also a church planner in Seattle. And I just want to say thank you for giving to the Annie Armstrong offering. Your gift not only supports church planners financially, but it also encourages our hearts to know that we're a part of something bigger. Our city is actually known as the city that cares forgotten about, but because of your generosity, our city is actually being known for the city that Jesus has not forgotten about. When you give to Annie Armstrong, you give to the missionaries, and that will help them to not focusing about working, to focusing about just serving. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Annie. I would not be a journeyman. Journeyman program wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for Annie. Annie allows for more feet to be on the ground in a hard place where people um, aren't really moving to to serve. We are seeing churches planted in South Florida that speak in seven languages. People hearing the gospel in seven languages all because you give. Our church was able to be blessed to be a recipient of the Annie Armstrong Easter offering a couple years back, but I want you to know that your giving then is producing church planting now. A través de tu apoyo económico en Puerto Rico, hemos podido iniciar iglesias en ciudades donde no había presencia Bautista del Sur en los pasados 20 años. It helps us to ensure that we're actually able to provide some practical gospel implication, not only in our cities, but also to the families that are doing the work in these communities. Not just meeting physical needs, but the chance to see lives transformed through meeting of those physical needs. We're part of something so much larger, so much greater. And we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for all these partners. Thank you. Thank you for giving to Annie Armstrong Fund, and thank you for investing in the lives of the next generation. If you agree that our United States of America needs missionaries, say amen. 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 The place that we are at today, unprecedented, never uh, seen before, and people need the Lord more, now more than, than we can even imagine. I'm, we're going to not really take it back a little bit today, but we're going to reflect on some songs that talk about eternity. And I hope that it doesn't grasp you in a way that you feel sad, but that you rejoice over what our Father has prepared for us. Sooner or later, and today is closer than it was yesterday, we're going to find ourselves in a wonderful place called heaven. And God's got some wonderful things in store for us there. So let's celebrate instead of be sad about what he's got for us. Let's stand together. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called a thunder, I'll be there. When the roll is called a thunder, when the roll is called a thunder, when the roll is called a thunder. That bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise And the glory of His resurrection share When His chosen ones shall gather to their own beyond the skies And the roll is called a thunder, I'll be there When the roll is called a thunder When the roll is called a thunder Let us talk of all his wondrous loving care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are
our days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, preparing the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh, and these are the days of your servant. David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as white in your world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds. Shining like the sun at the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and doubt of Zion's hill, salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Behold, He comes, riding. Clouds shining like the sun at the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Y'all have a seat. I'm sorry, David. David. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> the question was raised Is my conscience fair? A silly little lie. Didn't mean much, but it lingers still. In the corners of my mind Still you call me to walk On the edge of this world To spread my dreams and fly But the future's so far My heart is so frail Think I'd rather stay inside But you love me Like nothing in life that I've ever known. Yes, you love me anyway. Oh Lord, how you love me, how you love me. It's more than my strength. Simply be still. 
day may be to them goodbye. Tomorrow I'll rise up and fly. Heaven is near and I can't stay here. Goodbye, world, goodbye. Now don't you weep for me when I'm gone. I won't have to leave here alone. And when I hear that last trumpet sound, my feet won't stay on the ground. I'm gonna rise with the shout on the high. I'm gonna ride with my Lord through the sky. Heaven is near and I can't stay here. Goodbye, world. We all stand with him. Now don't you weep for me when I'm gone. Cause I won't have to leave here alone. That last trumpet sound, my feet won't stay on the ground. I'm gonna rise with a shout, gonna fly. I'm gonna ride with my Lord through the sky. Heaven is near, and I can't stay here. Goodbye, world, goodbye. Heaven is near, and I can't stay here. Y'all have a seat. They say that heaven's pretty and living here. But if they'd say that I would have to choose between the two, I'd go home. Going home where I belong. Sometimes when I'm dreaming,
Phelan got his pipes back. I tell you what, we singing all them upbeat songs. I was, I was about to start doing a jig up here, Brother Whalen. And then we was talking about going home. Talking about going home. I was about to get us Baptist. Woo! Get me all stirred up up here. Get me all stirred up. Children, we're going to let you go out to Children's Church right now. Hey, what you running for, man? What you running for? Ain't no hurry. No hurry. They excited. I'm glad to see my mama made it back there. I was looking around at the beginning of service, mama, and I think you was late. Got you came. All right. We, there's a five dollar late fee that I informed a few of the folks about this morning for Sunday school, but that applies for church too. So Y'all be bringing me your five dollar late fee when you get here, after service is over. All right. Some of y'all saying I'll just stay home from now on if I got to pay a late fee. No, get up, get here early. Amen. That's what you got to do. All right. Good to see you. Second Kings chapter five this morning. I talk to you about the subject of playing with fire. Now, some of you are not going to like this sermon this morning. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now. Because God may use it to put his finger on some of your secret sins that you're hiding. Things that your wife don't know about, or your husband don't know about, or your kids don't know about, or your mom and dad don't know about. Yeah. You knew it was going to be something like that, didn't you? There's a man that you probably don't remember ever reading his story in the Bible. Maybe you do. Maybe some of you do. A man named Gehazi. Huh? And about his story in this. I believe our world today is playing with fire. And we're going to learn in our lesson today that God has a word for us, and if we continue to play with fire, we need to be aware that, that fire is in our future. God's going to refurbish this old world by fire, he tells us one day. Hell is a place of fire. And so it's a call to repentance. You say, but preacher, we're all here this morning. Ain't this sermon for them people that's not here? You can sit in church on Sunday and be hiding things. Not hiding it from me. and, and you, I mean, you may be hiding it from me, but you're not hiding it from God. But God wants us to, to deal with things in our life. And, and it also deals with attitudes this morning. Attitudes about why we do what we do. And we see that with Gehazi today. He was a servant of of Elisha, not Elijah, we sang about Elijah this morning, but Elisha, who followed Elijah, did twice as many miracles as Elijah did, truly was a, a man used of God, and uh, he was his servant. So I say that to say this, he walked along with a prophet of God, saw him do at least 16 miracles, the Bible records it, 16 of them, and so basically you could say he, he just saw God move time and time again. He saw the hand of God. He heard the teachings of God. He saw the miracles of God. And yet there was something missing in his heart. And I want you to see how God deals with this man who, who I think it would be fair to compare him to say he went to church. He saw God answer prayers. He heard sermon after sermon. He watched. He went to Sunday school time and time again, yet there was things hid in his heart that was not right with God. Much like the story of Judas. Judas walked with the Lord, saw the great things Jesus did, and still, still betrayed him and, and, and died without him as the son of perdition. I want to begin with two principles before I read these scriptures. There are two principles you're going to get today. The Bible says, both of them in Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, in, Hebrew, in verse 6 of Hebrews 12, it says, God will chasten or punish those that He loves. 
You need to understand that's a principle of God. Just like you're going to punish your children if they go play in the street. You know? And two verses later, verse 8, he says, And if he doesn't punish you, you don't belong to him. So which is it? Do you, when you disobey God, do you find yourself sometimes under the chastening hand of God because He loves you and He knows if He doesn't get your attention, you're going to miss out on God, what He's got for you. And then sometimes, if you just get away with it and you live your life the way you want to live it and you don't care what God thinks, the Bible says you need to be careful now because if you don't come under the chastening hand of God, you're not born of God, but you're born of the devil. Meaning you've never been born again. And so let's listen to this this morning. God gave me this message to give you today, and I want you to see it. I want you to hear it. I want you to understand it. And Because as your pastor, there, and, and I, I, you know, again, I don't know anything. I, I, it's, you know, so things I'm talking about today, I don't even know what I'm talking about. All I know is God said preach this message today, and God's got it for somebody. A word for us today. Beginning in chapter 5 of 2 Kings, verse 20. Would you stand with me if you'd honor reading God's holy, inerrant, inspired word of God? And, and after I read these scriptures, I want to ask you to join me in prayer. This Tuesday, I'm going to be at the Capitol testifying before the House Committee on this new bill that's coming out about stopping the discussions of transgenderism and the sex things with our little children in our schools. And, uh, and so uh, we really need your prayers. Tuesday morning, we have to be there about 9 o'clock, and so going down tomorrow evening. But um, really make it a matter of prayer Tuesday, if you will. Uh, the world's going crazy. The world's playing with fire. They don't want me to talk to their children about Jesus, but yet they want to talk to them about this garbage. And so, uh, be a matter of praying with us about that Tuesday. Listen to what it says, beginning in verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman, this Syrian. This is right after the healing of the leprosy, when Naaman had leprosy and uh, God had healed him through Elisha. And, and uh, he spared Naaman, this Syrian, not even Jewish, you know. Well, why not, while not receiving from his hands what he brought, but as the Lord lives, I'll run after him and take something from him. After he had healed Naaman, Naaman had brought wealth to, to, to reward him, to thank him for this healing. He said, I don't want it. I, I don't want anything you got. You see, to him, uh, his ministry was not about fame and fortune. It was just about God and God being glorified. And so here he said, verse 21, So Gehazi pursued Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him, and he said, It is all well? And he said, All is well, my master has sent me, saying, Indeed, now he begins to lie, Saying, indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets, meaning these young men were, you know, seminary boys, they were learning, have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. Pretty, lot, pretty good bit of money for their day. So Naaman said, Please, take, take two talents, not just one. And he urged him and said, Bound two talents of silver in two bags and two changes of garments. And he handed them to the two of his servants, to two of his servants. And, and, and they carried them on ahead of him. So he didn't even have to carry it back. And when he came to the citadel, he, he took them from their hand, stored them away in the house. And then he let the men go and they departed. And now he went in and stood before the master, Elisha. And said to him, and, and Elisha said to him, where, where did you go, Gehazi? And, and he said, your servant did not go anywhere. Lying again. Then he said to him, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and receive clothing and olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female sheep, servants? Therefore... The leprosy of Naaman 
which I just healed, shall now cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out of his presence. Out of his pre- and from out of, and went out from his presence leprous as white as snow. Let's pray. God, as we open these scriptures today, we're reminded that spiritual things are nothing to play with. We're reminded, Lord, of integrity and honesty are nothing to, to bypass as believers. For you tell us, Lord, that our yea should be yea and our nay should be nay and we shouldn't have to swear at anything because we're people of integrity. And God, we're reminded today that we don't need, we don't have to have as much as we think we need. We're reminded today, Lord, of, of your desire for us to humble ourselves in your presence. We're reminded today, Lord, that there's a a payday someday. There's a judgment coming when we're going to stand before you and give account of our lives. And the real test of where we spend eternity, the real test will show up who we really are, will show up in our lives while we're still here. Whether we're people who are trustworthy, who have right priorities, who have integrity, who sometimes face the chastening hand of our God because He loves us so much. A God that demands our attention. Lord, today speak to this Your people. From Your Word is my prayer. By Your Holy Spirit. And it's in His name we pray. Amen and amen. Be seated. Tuesday, I'm going to that capital for one reason. I believe as a nation we are playing with fire. Right now, we're debating whether or not to, and really, their argument's going to be, well, we haven't had a case like that in the state, and we don't need to worry about it. And, and even though Illinois is doing it, and California's doing it, and New York's doing it, and therefore it's headed our way, in fact, I'm told by, by significant people today that know that there is very little curriculum headed down the pipeline in the public school system that does, does not promote the le- lesbian, gay, transgender agenda. Can't hardly find it. And if we don't speak out, if the church remains silent... And we continue to play with fire. Somebody's got to sound the alarm. And we must be on our knees praying because there is danger ahead if we say all this stuff is acceptable to us. I want to point out four things that I believe Gehazi did today that were wrong. Four things that shows that he was one of those playing with fire. And why he found himself, uh, there were some things lacking spiritually, obviously, in his life. The first thing, he rejected heaven's way. Verse 20 talks about what heaven's way was. It talks about how that, that uh, Elisha didn't need anything from that man, from Naaman. He didn't need the wealth. He didn't do it for money. He did it for the glory of God. And, and, and that was God's way, at least in this particular situation. God told him, don't take anything. But Gehazi said, I don't, I don't like that way. I don't like doing it heaven's way. I want to do it my way. I could use a little extra silver. I could use a little extra gold, a fancy garment or two, a new suit. I'm going to run this dude down, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it my way. And so here he focused on gold was his God. Greed was his motto. And, uh, and he was a man who, without a doubt, it, it appears, was focused on getting ahead in life. To him, uh, he was like a lot of people today. They think they've been successful in life based upon the size of their bank account or the, the value of their estate when they die. I'm here to tell you today that you haven't necessarily gotten ahead because you've got a big bank account. You can have all the money in the world and be miserable, number one, while you're alive and die and spend eternity in hell when you die. So the money's not going to do you any good. Elisha, again, as I said, had just healed 
Naaman of leprosy, and uh, had chosen not to, not to make fame and fortune and popularity and, and again, the wealth, whatever the gifts were. Uh, he, he had chosen not to let that be. That was what God had directed Elisha, the prophet. That's what God had said. This is how we're going to do business this time. Not to say that Elijah had never received anything from anybody he'd ever blessed or been a part of. And not to say that he hadn't received offerings at other times. But this time, God said, don't take anything. And that wasn't good enough. That was heaven's way. You see the example here? Heaven's got a way today. And sometimes and many times, if not most of the time, it's not man's way. It's, 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 it's going to do it its own way. We, we have a way that, that decides to bypass God's way and think that I can do this. I can accomplish this. I, and you know what? Every time you and I try to figure out a way to do it on our own, what we're saying is, God, I don't need you. Or, God, your way is not a good way. And, God, I need to help you here. God don't need your help. He don't need my help. You know what we typically are? Most of us, we try to manipulate things in our life, don't we? We do. We try to manipulate our, our way of getting what we want and manipulate others. Sometimes even maybe try to manipulate God. You ever think about that? Think we can manipulate God to get our way, but that doesn't work. So the first thing, he rejected heaven's way. The second thing, he resorted to hell's way. He resorted to doing things the way the devil would have him do it instead of his way. I read, read an article this week and it said teenage discouragement is up in the last few years from 26% to 44%. That's almost half of our teenagers are discouraged. From what? What's changed? I don't believe they're discouraged just because of COVID. I believe a lot of what they're discouraged about is sometimes maybe they've not been taught on what they need to be encouraged about. But I think primarily a lot of it comes from social media. I think a lot of it comes from now you can get bullied by somebody and nobody else knows you're getting bullied. You can get talked ugly to. You can get used to they had to do it to your face. At least then, Randy, we could pop him in the eye if we had to. Amen? May not have made him feel better, but it made me feel better. Amen? I've been bullied out there, eh? all right? And I want you to know that without a doubt, without a doubt, when we resort to doing things our way, when we resort to, to having to constantly be focused on all the negative things of the world, friends, it'll get you down. I'm telling you, drugs and alcohol, there are so many things that are destroying a young, our younger generation right now. And their faith has just gone off of a cliff. Why? Because a lot of times they're listening to negative, ugly people who believe in living life hell's way. And therefore, that's all they think about. And the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart... So will he be. As you think about things, what you think about is going to determine how you feel about life. And my friend, I, my greatest encouragement to you just in short right there would be get your mind set on things above and not on the things of this earth. Oh, let the mind, this mind which is in you, which is in Christ, be in you. Let that mind of Christ be evident in your life. Praise and worship the Lord. But yet we see here in our story today, Gehazi had his own ideas about ministry. Had his own ideas about the benefits of doing things his way instead of Elisha's way. As I said earlier, he was kind of like that Judas Iscariot who had traveled with Jesus, seen all the great things Jesus did, still didn't buy into Jesus' way and sold him out at the end. And here, here we see a man who had seen all the great miracles of Elijah sell out. You see, I believe it was the lust of the flesh that drove Gehazi. It was the lust of the flesh. It was the lust of the religion of a little bit more. They asked the Rockefellers one day how much money would be enough. I mean, you know, they had more than they could spend in ten lifetimes. 
How much will be enough, Mr. Rockefeller? He said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. That's the religion of hedonism, the religion of desiring to pleasure and profits and, and just to playing in the world. And you see, the lust of the flesh, I believe, is what drove him to do the works of the flesh. It took control of him. The Bible says when, when sin, where sin comes from, it says in the book of James, chapter 1, it says when we're drawn away in our lust and enticed, and, and we begin to think about that sinful thing, doing things hell's way, and before long, it becomes something that becomes our motivation and our inspiration, and it drives us to sin, the Bible teaches us. And so here we see the lust of the flesh and its power. Deceit now controlled his words. He began to lie for what he wanted. And the devil... The devil began to bless him. I wish I could stand here to you this morning and tell you if you followed hell's way, there's no blessings in that. I wish I could stand here this morning and tell you that some of the things that you're thinking about and some of the things that you're doing that nobody thinks about, nobody knows about, some of those things I wish I could tell you that it's not going to be fun. But the Bible says sin is pleasurable for a season. For a season. But then there's a payday. Then there's a judgment. And we have to be aware that you may get some pleasure. From it. I saw a guy one time that, that had, uh, had been a drug addict, uh, sold drugs, been involved in the world, always wanted to be a truck driver, always wanted to have a cross-country truck driving job. Well, I'm going to tell you, he got saved. He got radically saved. And when he got radically saved for the first time in years, he was clean enough to pass a drug test. And after coming to church for a number of months and was growing in the Lord, he got a job driving a truck cross country. And guess what? He couldn't be in church no more. But he thought that was a good thing. My counsel to him is I'm not so sure it is. I'm not sure that's not the devil blessing you to get you out of church. And out away from the people of God. Couldn't convince him of that. He thought it was God blessing him. I'm here to tell you he fell out of church and fell away from God. And, and um, went through some real hard times after that. But I'm saying that to say this to you. That there are some things that the devil will bless you with to try to get you to do what he wants you to do. Not every blessing is from God. Do you hear me? Not every financial blessing is from God. Not every pleasurable thing you can do is from God. Not every profit, money profit, is from God. You have to understand that anything the devil can do to get you away from God's attention, God's going to try to do what he can to get you, your attention back to him. So here we see, guys, he was lying, cheating, stealing. But he didn't think, he didn't think there was a payday someday. Maybe he hadn't heard enough sermons from Elisha on the fact that, yeah, it seems fun today, but there's going to be a day when you're going to stand before God. And you're going to give account for what you've done in your life. And if you're saved, if you're really a man of faith, God's going to deal with you while you're still walking around. Now, I know there's people today say, oh, we're, we're in the grace walk. We're, we're part of the grace walk movement. God don't care what we do. God is never going to punish us for what we do. I'm here to tell you, God loves you enough to deal with you about your sin. He loves you enough to get your attention. Has that ever, have you, did you grow up that way? I did. I remember one time I had my first car. I mean, I had my first car. I mean, it cost $800. And I had such mean parents, I had to buy my own car. I had to buy my own gas to go on dates. And, and I remember one time that I just didn't think I had. I mean, I was working at Roach Nursery. And I made $80 a week. 
and I had to fill up. That's big money, wasn't it, Brother Ed? And, and, I, and I had to fill up my tank with gas, and I had to pay for my date. And, and I didn't have money to feel like I had money to tithe. Anybody ever? Anybody ever feel like you didn't have money to tithe? And I took my tithe money, and I paid for my date. And guess what happened the day after my date? A tire blew out on my car. And it cost me more than twice of what my tithe would have been to get my tire fixed. Hmm. God taught me a lesson that day. In fact, the Bible said, did you know the Bible says, if we take that which belongs to God or which has been vowed to God, God's not only going to collect the tenth, He's going to collect the fifth. It says it right at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. He's going to collect the fifth. Now, I know if you're in the grace walk and God doesn't care and God's never going to judge you about anything, that you just believe the Bible's lying when it said God will chase and knows that He loves. But you see, maybe He never listened to Elisha's sermon on the, the God who loves you enough to whip your tail if you need a whipping. Some parents need to learn that lesson too today. Hello? Let me just get off of the subject of, of this for just a moment and say, if a few more parents would wear out a few more belts on a few more bottoms, we'd have a lot less trouble with our children. Are you with me? The Bible says if we spare the rod, we're going to spoil the child. I know Dr. Spock says, Dr. Spock was an idiot when it came to parenting. Let me just publicly say, Dr. Mike says Dr. Spock was a parenting idiot. I'm going to tell you something. You love them enough to whip that tail if it needs to be whipped. Oh, preacher, I can't believe you said that. You're just breaking my heart. Well, you just spare the rod. And then you'll call Brother Mike in a few years. Brother Mike, my children are rebellious. What are you going to do? I ain't going to do nothing. I'll pray for you, but you raise some knotheads. You raise some rebellious children who don't respect you. They don't respect their school teachers. They don't respect the police when they stop them. They don't respect the judge that's going to send them to jail. And you want me to help you pick up the pieces. I will. I'll bring a broom and a dustpan and I'll pick up the pieces when it's all over. Parents, we have to wake up. And we have to do, fulfill our responsibilities and raise our children to the glory of God. Now, I should have saved that sermon for next Sunday, which was Mother's Day. But I want you to understand that there's a day of judgment coming in our homes if we don't make our children realize that they're going to respect authority. And guess what? If they don't respect all those other authorities, they don't respect God either. They don't respect God. And so he chose to go hell's way. That seemed like Gehazi's wise path. A third thing I want you to see today, he resisted the honest way. He lied again and again, didn't he? He lies. And, and the Bible says this. Did you know the Bible tells us in the book of John that, that the, the devil is the father of lies? He's the father of lies. That's one of the things about the devil. He's a liar. Truth is not in him. Gehazi takes his silver and his garments and he, he goes back and not only does he lie to Naaman, but he, then he goes back and he lies to Elisha. He lies to the prophet of God and, and boy, when you think about it, he should have been around him long enough to know he's going to see through his lies. But he didn't even learn that. But yet his greed was greater than his desire for God. Some folks will sit in church and they'll say, 
They'll say, Pastor, I, it, it's okay. I, I like being here. I like hearing about God. But they can sit right there, and sometimes their greed is greater than their God. Sometimes they can sit right there, and their pleasure, and thinking about, thinking about running around and partying and, and, and getting high and all this kind of stuff is greater than their God. It is their God. Because those things, everybody here is going to have a God. You've got a God, just like you've got a testimony. Something is God in your life. It may be you. It may be money. It may be God. I pray it's God. But Gehazi resorts to lying like the devil and, and following after his God, which was prosperity. And prosperity was definitely more important to him than integrity. I've known people to be sitting in church. I pastored one in the state of Georgia, and I just found out he was picked up for, for having his computers full of child pornography. I pastored him, sat in church every Sunday. But yet his God was pleasure. His God was perversion. And I'm here to tell you something. I don't know you. I, I don't, I'd like to tell you that I know everything about you guys. But I don't. I don't, know what's, I don't know what's going on in your heart. Only you and God know that. That's why when I bury people at funerals, I sometimes say, I mean, I can tell you I've seen some fruit. I've seen some wonderful things. It looks like this person was a godly person. But the fact is, I try to come out and say it. I may not get to that, say it that clear sometimes. But, but the fact is, that person that I'm burying, I don't know if they're going to heaven or hell. Only them and God know that. Because they might have totally fooled me for all those years. you know and God knows and if you're not careful you need to know today that you're playing with fire listen to some of these Bible verses this is uh, three or four times it's listed in the New Testament it's in Matthew 10 20 it's in Mark 4 22 Luke 8 17 it says nothing hidden will not be disclosed did you know that all the sins you think you're hiding, it's open scandal in heaven. Psalm 90 verse 8 says, Our secret sins will be revealed in the light of God the Father. I paraphrase that. So we just need to be aware. That's the honest way. We need to always be honest. Again, I'm not talking about anybody here today. Nobody's come and told me something about some secret sins. Nobody's come and told me today. But I would just venture to say that if the church is not perfect and the church, but we, I, I would not be much of a shepherd and much of a pastor if I did not warn you that if you are one of those playing with fire, you're going to get burned. You're going to get burned if you keep playing with it. And last of all, he received God's holy wrath. He lied. He cheated. He had wrong motives. Verse 26 tells us that he revealed to Elijah, that God had revealed to Elijah what Gehazi did. Gehazi said, I didn't do anything. I didn't go anywhere. He said, oh, yeah, you did. He said, I, I, I was with you. I, I saw everything. God revealed to me everything when you chased down Naaman and got the silver and the garments. I saw it all. Wow. And verse 27 says, now here's what we're going to do about it. God sought to get Gehazi's attention before it was too late. And, and that's why I believe God gave me this message today. If this speaks to you, if there is something that you're hiding from God or that you're hiding from someone else, today is the day God's trying to get your attention. I don't like this sermon, preacher. I'd rather you just come in here and say God loves everybody and right after whatever you're doing, God doesn't care and it's going to be okay 
and we're going to all go to heaven one day and let's sing more of those songs about heaven and there's no day of accountability. I'd rather just hear those kind of sermons, preacher. You're in the wrong place. Because here you're going to get the whole truth, the full truth. And so it goes on here to say, now, now you may say that I think that's a mean God. I think God was mean to Gehazi. He should have just given him more mercy and let him go. The Bible says he judged Gehazi because he loved him. And he wanted to get his attention, I believe. Because had he not judged him, and had there not been a conviction, had there not been a feeling about his life, had he not been revealing this stuff here, had he not revealed all this, I believe it would have been God's way of saying, I'm not, I, I don't have any say so in what happened to him. He's not mine. He, he's not mine. Gehazi's not mine. So I don't have a real say. I'm not going to go out and punish him. His punishment's coming after he dies. He's going to spend eternity in hell. But while he's walking on this earth, listen, if you're lost today, if you're lying, if you're playing a game with God and you're not saved today, you need to have as much fun as you can have while you're alive on this earth. You're the first preacher told me to go out and have all the fun I want to have in life. I'm telling you, you better get all the joy you can get out of this life because there's coming a day that you're going to cry out to God. And you're going to regret the day that you sat in church and you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and God put His finger on your sin in your heart and you did nothing about it. You refused to repent and let God have His way. And therefore, you better have as much fun. You better live like the devil while you're here on this earth and play and get all the blessings of the devil because you're going to spend eternity without God. Without any love, without any mercy, you're going to live in darkness. You're going to smell smoke your whole life. You're going to hear the, the, the gnashing of teeth your whole life. You say, preacher, you're painting an ugly picture this morning. You need, sometimes it takes an ugly picture to wake us up. So you better go out and have all the fun you can have. And I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are sharp. Some of you are thinking, I'm going to keep sowing my wild oats. And, and right before I die, I'm going to say, right before I die, I'm going to say, Oh God, I accept Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. I want to go to heaven now. Unless you run into an 18-wheeler head on. Hello? Or what if God doesn't convict you of that sin? And what if God doesn't draw you? You don't decide when you're coming to God. God decides when you're coming to God. Today, God may be convicting you of that secret sin. And He may be saying to you, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are burdened and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Receive me. And I will give you the right to become the children of God. Get up out of that pew. We still believe in our church that you still have to take a step of faith. That you're going to have to get out of that pew and you're going to have to come and you're going to have to say, God, I am a sinner. Today, I, re I am so sorry for my sinfulness. And God, today, I repent of that sin. And God, instead of doing things my way and having my secret sins, God, I want to follow you. I don't want to be a Judas. And God, today, I take you by the hand. The Bible says here that Gehazi received the leprosy. Not only did he receive it, who else received it? The rest of his family forever. Well, that's not fair. That's a mean God. 
One other last thing before we close and get our invitation. You, some of us think that our sin is our business. It's nobody's business but mine. Friend, you may be bringing down your whole family. You may be bringing down your whole family. Happened a number of times in the Bible when they went into Ai and they faced a defeat and they came back. And, and you remember the, the guy who had stolen the, 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 the gold and the silver and the Babylonian garment. I don't know what it was about garments back in them days, but they really liked the garments. I don't know. But they, they got him a garment. He hid it all. And, and you remember when they said, take everything that he, that he, he stole from Ai. He said, take it, take it out there, pile up in a pile and burn it. Oh, and by the way, when you finish burning, burn his family and everything he owns too. Burn the sheep, the goats, the camels. Burn it all. Well, I can hear his wife saying, I didn't do nothing. You see, the Bible says that our sins, we need to be careful for our sins pass down the third and fourth generation. Now, that doesn't mean that dad committed a sin and, and all of a sudden the kid's got to pay for it. No. What it means is, dad, if you live like a heathen, and dad, you don't judge your children, and dad, you don't have anything to do with God, don't be surprised when your kids don't want to have anything to do with God. And then their kids don't want to have anything to do with God. And that's what we're dealing with in America today. We're dealing with a generation where the last couple of generations just didn't have time for God. Or maybe they had their other ideas about God. They done decided God was more interested in them being wealthy or whatever. But, but whatever reason, now we've come down to two or three generations later and the kids who were raised in families who thought chasing balls and playing ball all over the world or, or, or thought about other things was more important than God. And church was just kind of one of those things that, well, I just kind of, you know, I go once or twice a month and I consider myself committed. You're not committed. You're not committed because you, you find time to squeeze God into your schedule. Is it okay that I preach this today? I mean, y'all can have a meeting and run me off when this church service is over. Because to be honest with you, if you don't want to hear it, I don't want to be here. I'll find that God will put me somewhere that they do want to hear it. But I'm, I'm just saying to you that it's important that we understand that if you don't find time for God, your kids are going to find less time for God. And their kids are going to find less time for God. And that's where we are today as America. Today, many of them's God is Facebook, Snapchat, Wickle Pickle. I don't know what to name all these apps are nowadays that they are. And they like the app. You know what, like, you know what apps they like today? apps they like today are the kind that they can put something on there and it disappears after a few minutes. And mom and daddy can't find out about it. Whew. Nobody else knows about it. God knows. And you can lie to me and you can lie to your mom and dad, but you can't lie to God. You're playing a dangerous game. And you know this? Brother Whalen, y'all come on. The musicians come on. Did you know this? Did you know that hell will be more tolerable for some people than for others? That's what Jesus said. Jesus said that hell will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah? Then it will for the people of the city, uh, I just went blank, Capernaum or one of those cities. He said, it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than it is for them. Why? He said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had heard the preaching you heard, this is what he basically meant. If they had seen the miracles you had seen, if Jesus had visited them, if they had seen the things, Capernaum or whichever city it was that he said, if they had seen what you saw, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Therefore, he said, hell is going to be more tolerable for the perverts of Sodom and Gomorrah than for you. Because you've seen a lot more than they've seen. In other words, if you die and go to hell after sitting 
at Washita Baptist Church, under this sermon this morning, are the last six years of that I've been here. If you die and go to hell, it's going to be worse for you than it will for those perverts of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to be hotter. Preacher, I, you sure are hard. You're mad this morning, ain't you? No, I ain't mad. God just said, these people need to wake up. It might be one person God's speaking to here this morning. It might just be one person. And if this is not talking about you, I just let it go right over your head. Better yet, let it go right into your heart and then take it out and tell other people about it. Because they may not be here this morning, but they still need to hear about it. People that you work with, people you go to school with, we need to stop playing with fire. And God wants us to realize we're playing with fire. That's what Gehazi was doing. Don't do it, folks. It don't matter how the liberals tell you. It don't matter what the woke crowd tells you today. I know I ain't got skinny jeans. I ain't got a man bun. I don't know how I'm going to make it in eternity. But I'm here to tell you something. God sent me here this morning to warn you. And if it's not speaking to you, you may need to warn somebody else. We're playing with fire. Would you bow with me? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Fathers, we come this morning. You have spoken loudly and clearly in this place. I just am the messenger. The Holy Spirit penetrates the hearts of this church this morning to not play games with God with the things of God with sin and God I ask you today to stir our hearts in this invitation God, if there's some here this morning who have secret sins, Lord, that they want to come and confess it and repent of it this morning and get right with God, I pray you right now begin to convict, begin to call them, Lord, and begin to change their lives. Lord, if there are Christians here this morning, people who've seen the works of God, maybe they're just backslidden, maybe they're cold, um, apathetic and they're playing the game the church game they're not serious they just come to church when there's nothing else to do God touch their heart right now God may they repent before they face your wrath Have your way is our prayer. God, this invitation is yours. It's not mine. It's yours. Do what you want to do. Help us to be obedient right now. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. As we sing this song, you come. Let God have his way. When I cry.
when I am alone. Be thinking, what do I do? What do I need to do? If you've never been saved, you need to come to me this morning and say, Pastor, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Three little words. And I'll explain to you what that means. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Thank you so much for being here this morning. This invitation, I think, is something you're going to have to take home and ponder. I knew not a lot of folks wanted to run to the altar this morning and say, I got secret sin, I got secret sin, look at me, I got secret sin. But you need to take it home and you need to ponder it. You need to think about it. Don't forget it when you walk out the door. Meditate on it. See what God tells you. Maybe you know somebody else that this message was for. You know what's going on in their life. They're playing the game. And you need to speak to them. God doesn't put everybody in my path to speak to. A lot of these folks, they're in your path. And you need to speak to them. And we take the messages sometimes from here, out there, to speak it to our world. Thank you for being here today in the house of the Lord. Does anything need to be announced? VBS meeting today at 5 o'clock in here, in the, in the fellowship hall. Okay. Are y'all going to have any snacks? I'm trying to decide whether I'm coming or not. I don't know. Okay. Anything else need to be announced? Ed, how about you dismiss us? Lord, we pray that each need was met here today, especially those that went to the altar. Thank you for this message. Thank you for the messenger, Lord. We, we love him and thank you for him, Lord. Just bless each one in this congregation today. Be with us through travel to our home. Give us safe travel, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.